So I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, special prize session, plenary session of the APS meeting. Um, our first speaker today is Gene Parker, uh, who received his PhD from Caltech in 1951 and has been at the University of Chicago since 1955. He is the 2018 recipient of the APS Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research. And the citation reads, for fundamental contributions to space physics, plasma physics, solar physics, and astrophysics for over 60 years. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the National Medal of Science in 1989, and many, many other honors. And last year, NASA renamed its upcoming mission to the sun, the Parker Solar Probe Plus. So it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Gene to give uh, a talk on uh, rapid reconnection and field line topology. Well, I thought I'd talk a little bit about magnetohydrodynamics this morning. Uh, looking at an aspect that is normally not treated, and that is uh, the dissipation of a magnetic field. Because way back when magnetohydrodynamics was first invented, it was great, it seemed to solve a lot of problems, but things never, theoretically, they never moved fast enough to match the observations. In particular, something that sh should uh, theoretically decay, a magnetic field that should theoretically decay uh, in a thousand years or maybe a hundred years uh, in the sun seemed to have a way of doing it in a matter of hours. So there was a lot of thought put into it and I'll just review those very quickly. Uh, normally, the decay, diffusive decay time uh, of a magnetic field of scale L is L squared over the resistive diffusion coefficient. But in fact, nature was doing it uh, a thousand times faster than that. And that put a lot of people to thinking about it. The first move, the first successful step was made by Peter Sweet who with a rather complicated analysis using the electric fields and the magnetic fields and the motion of the fluid, you can get two opposite fields to eat each other up very quickly. If you press them together and squeeze the gas out from between them, then the scale drops and the rate of diffusion becomes large. The next, the next point I want to make is that it's really just the magnetic fields and the motion of the fluid. And uh, Peter's analysis, though entirely correct, was very clumsy to work with because he felt that somehow the electric field should be involved. Well, the electric fields have negligible stress. The electric currents transmit no stress, and uh, it's really just a tussle between the magnetic field and the fluid, in which case you can write down Peter Sweet's result in just a couple of lines. It's now called rapid reconnection, where when you press two, say, oppositely directed fields or non-parallel fields, when you press them together, they squeeze the gas out from between. The gradients increase without bound until resistive diff diffusion comes in. And it was uh, an enormous breakthrough. And uh, it's now known as rapid reconnection. Uh, that's what somebody means with those words. Well, the trouble is it wasn't really fast enough to account for solar flares where fields annihilate each other, where magnetic fields annihilate each other. And so more thought was given to it. And Harry Pecek pointed out that when you squeeze two fields together, they don't have to meet over the whole front of contact. It's enough that this rapid reconnection should go on in some small part of the, the front. 
And that put, it turned out that made the effect that much more effective. And it, you could match the speed of flares and so forth. And a good deal of effort has gone into particular configurations of magnetic fields to suit particular flares. Well, uh, let's see. The next thing, the, the, the next, uh, the next big step was, uh, let, me, let me think, I had two or three things listed there. Well, let me, uh, let me show you a very brief, here's a sketch of rapid reconnection where the pressure in the middle of the field is pushing it together and giving you uh, your cutting field lines. Here is the Petchek model where the little box in the center is the limiting area and things go with some significant fraction of the Alvane speed and one can spread this out and look at the various cross sections. This is a, a line, well you can see a line through a point and uh, the X type neutral point in the transverse field and if you squeeze the field from both sides, you begin to cut through, let's see, a, here is where you've pressed the field together. There hasn't been any diffusion yet. And now there is diffusion and you've cut the field. It's called reconnection. And uh, this moved the subject forward a, lo a long, a long way. Uh, laboratory experiments, particularly at Princeton, have shown that uh, Harry's uh, first model that he used to justify his point that the reconnection takes place only at a small point in the middle and to show that, that in some ranges of parameters that's what you get. So it's a, well here we talk about an optical analogy. I want to switch now to confine my remarks to a force-free field, that is a field on which the gas is not pushing in any way. The uh, field is uh, not pushing on the gas, the gas is not pushing on the field. And it's a curious thing that in spite of the curvature of the flux surfaces, the magnetic field lines follow the path of an optical ray in an index of refraction proportional to the magnitude of the field. Uh, here's, an, well, here's an example that's not terribly interesting. This, if you press it together on the field at a particular location indicated by the circle in the middle, you may squeeze the field out of that region, leaving a hole in it, and then the fields on either side, that is above or below the uh, plane of the screen, uh, open, open up a gap in the field, I guess is the way to put it. And uh, that lets the opposite components come through. And here is a sketch uh, showing a region where the field has been uh, well, let's see. Well, I guess that's not going to show up properly. Uh, let me move on. Now, uh, I have often used uh, uh, the analogy that magnetohydrodynamics is nothing more than hydrodynamics. 
with the magnetic field stresses thrown in from the bargain. And the question is, what are we going to do with the position? Well, what, we've got to turn our attention to topology. And you ask a general question, what field line topologies are conducive to local rapid reconnection? Well, that turns out to be a question with, as far as I can tell, no nice, simple answer. Whoop. So let's uh, turn away from current sheets and compressed layers of field and turn our attention to uh, a typical uh, loop or arch in the sun. I've sketched one here which shows the arch and uh, the, you see how the field lines have been interleaved, have, have been mixed up with each other because of the random motions of the foot points of the field at the photosphere. Suppose you started this loop without all this uh, inter, whatever you want to call it, interleaving. It would not be long before you build it up and it, it, such a loop would have the topology that I have sketched here to sh illustrate. And the question is, what can I tell about the equilibrium of this field? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the complication of a curved field. I'm going to treat a field that extends from the plane z equals 0 to z equals l and see what I can learn from that. And it's the same uh, switching around of field lines and interleaving of field lines that I had on the previous slide. Let's see. To give you a formula for the fluid uh, and uh, well, for the fluid motions and the interlaced field, I uh, treat this simple model where the, there is. 2D incompressible fluid motion in the planes parallel to the z equals zero. And that will give you any arbitrary, uh, with certain restrictions on the function psi, which is a function of x, y, and the quantity k, z, t, indicating that I'm winding the field in, the, the, of this interlacing is being wound in from uh, uh, z equals L or z equals plus infinity. And uh, the topology, therefore, is somehow defined by the function psi. So let's move ahead. And I would point out that curl B equals alpha B, as I've shown here, is the formula for a force-free field. That is, the divergence of the magnetic stress tensor is zero. Now that equation is very dissective. It looks simple, it looks linear, and it ought to be solvable, only it isn't. Because the alpha is unspecified and uh, is part of the solution to the problem. And uh, we need to solve that equation and to, let's examine its properties. If I take the curl of curl B equals alpha B, I get equation five here. B cross the gradient in alpha is equal to del squared B plus alpha squared B. That's a quasi-linear equation, linear in the highest derivatives and it's an, with a Laplacian operator there, it's an elliptic equation. Sounds all very familiar and straightforward. And if you take the divergence of curl B equals alpha B, you get B dot grad alpha equals zero, which tells you the astonishing fact that no matter how you wind up and uh, interleave and uh, twist the field lines, 
in equilibrium, the torsion coefficient alpha is uniform along the field. And if you think about that in your mind a little bit, it sounds just about impossible. Uh, imagine trying to get one little flux bundle up through the field and the suppose the topology is more than just simple twisting. You find that you need to have alpha to vary along the field line if you're going to keep avoid a discontinuity, a current sheet along the sides of your little flux bundle. And uh, as a matter of fact, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. Now, uh, let's think a little bit about it. Uh, does an equilibrium exist? Well, here's a field, a magnetic field, that's anchored at both ends. And it is, uh, there is, uh, no matter how you uh, twist these flux bundles, you, I'm trying to think of a way to put the words. There's, a, there's an equilibrium for everything here. The field lines are trapped. They're clamped at both ends at z equals zero and z equals l. And there's, there's an equilibrium no matter how you wind them around each other. But I just said there's no equilibrium unless alpha, the torsion, is constant along every field line. And keep that in mind. Uh, we'll use it in uh, just a moment. The question is, uh, what sort of solutions are there to B dot grad alpha equals zero? And if you fool around with the equation, I won't waste your time doing that. Uh, you find that you can Right, uh, you can treat the, the longitudinal field B as the base field and the transverse components as small perturbations. And uh, the, the, uh, this is a tricky transformation because this equation has a, a set of characteristics which are real, namely the field lines. And this limits your ability to maneuver. And I've written down, the, the, I did the algebra here. And you get th these two equations, uh, 14 and 15. And uh, Van Balihuyen, who was the first to write that equation down, pointed out that this equation you're looking at, 14 and 15, are the, exactly the equations for the vorticity in a two-dimensional space. And the, it, that's interesting because it has challenged the, some of the great mathematicians of history to solve the equation in some way. And there are only a very few restricted solutions. The equation is essentially unsolvable by conventional algebraic maneuvers. And the question then is, where do we go from here? We've just talked ourselves into a contradiction. All configuration, all topologies have solutions. Here is the equation for the solution, for the, and we can't solve it because of that extra set of real characteristics. And uh, if you turn to, uh, I'm trying to think of the Quran and Hilbert, mathematical physics, they take up uh, such equations and they point out that you've got, these are the only continuous solutions, are the solutions of this equation uh, analogous to uh, the vorticity equation. What about all the other 
because with that arbitrary inter interleaving, inter inter uh, twisting uh, that we found, uh, there's all possible topologies. Well, uh, it's comforting to find from Quran and Hilbert that you get what are called weak solutions. I don't know why they're considered weak, in which you have uh, discontinuities. In, the, in our case, they would represent current sheets, and uh, you have a complicated bunch where the region is boxed off. It, it's a sort of a irregular honeycomb, I guess, you'd look at. And uh, those solutions are a combination of regions of continuous field and uh, discontinuities. So when we go back, uh, uh, the, the uh, vorticity equation, it has uh, solutions but they, they can be shown to cascade to small scales with the passage of time. And the kinetic energy analog actually evolves, cascades to large scales. And that is all you can get out of it. So we conclude that the solutions to the starting with the initial equation and that uh, interwoven field uh, that I showed you. Starting with that field, and uh, let's, let's stretch it in the vertical direction so that the transverse components are small and then we can reduce it to this vorticity equation whose solutions, insofar as they are known, are completely different from the general mess of topology that I showed, well, that, that So let's think about our solutions here. We have a field with arbitrary topology. There are some continuous solutions. In fact, there are infinitely many continuous solutions, but they're very restricted topology. They're the topology of vorticity evolution. And the other solutions, we can't calculate, but we can prove their existence, in which they have combinations of discontinuities, current sheets interspersed with the continuous regions. And, the, and that's almost all of the, uh, almost all of the solutions. The, Continuous solutions are a set of measure zero compared, compared to them. And from that, I am obliged to conclude that starting with this gently but complicated interweaving of field lines, just sit back and let it relax to equilibrium. And in so doing, it'll, it will form its own discontinuities. And this is another step on the understanding of the, dis, uh, of the dissipation of magnetic field. We know that you can get discontinuities by squeezing the field or twisting it to, and generally deforming it. But now we find that starting with any deformed field, You, uh, st starting with any de deformed field, it will take upon itself 
the generation of discontinuities as it relaxes. And if the magnetic, if, if the fluid was infinitely conducting so that there was complete preservation of the flux, it would lock into this, finally reach into this condition where the, you have discontinuities throughout the region. So uh, there's a, it seems that no matter which way you turn, whether it's rapid reconnection in the manner I described, or whether it's this topological difficulty, contradiction that we've gotten ourselves into, which says that a lot of the solutions will be, will be their equilibrium will automatically have current sheets in it, eases the problem where our theory, our theoretical decay was trying to keep up with nature. So when you look at activity on the sun, vigorous reconnection, vigorous flaring, because really there is resistivity in the medium and these discontinuities which form here so placidly, in fact, are the growing discontinuities and with real resistivity, even a small amount, you start cutting the field lines and your topology evolves as the, as the twisting of the field relaxes. And that raises some interesting questions. First, let me say I cannot calculate the configuration of the field. I can only prove limiting th th things about it that we're going to have discontinuities. But if you had a real setup in a laboratory where you had uh, the magnetic field B in uh, uh, an infinitely conducting fluid, it would gradually uh, cut and reduce the topology, and this evolution would go on until finally, somehow, somewhere, you reach an, an overall equilibrium, uh, something that is a, uh, something that it is uh, of the form of the vorticity equation. That uh, that com kind of completes as much as we know about how fields de decay, we're getting away from this 100 year decay time that just pure uh, laminar hydrodynamics would get you. And uh, numerical work has begun with several people. Franco Rapazzo is one that I know who's done some beautiful numerical work, and with the capacity of a modern computer, I think it is realistic to think of exploring the continuous solutions. And remember, in every equilibrium, even though there are discontinuities, the spaces between them are filled with continuous fields which satisfy the vorticity equation. Uh, I think I'll uh, I'll quit at that point, and uh, I want to mention that I think this is an unsolved problem that needs attention and is finally in the range where one can do it using proper numerical methods. So thank you for your attention. any questions, I ask people to go to one of the three microphones uh, stationed there. I'm sorry? Or if I'll... I need to relate your question to Jesus. So, Virginia wants to know, what advice do you have for the younger generation just starting out?
Think about the physics and when you come on an interesting problem, see if you can solve it. <laughs> and and the, the problem I proposed here is a big one. Uh, I don't have the energy to you know, go anywhere with it, uh, but there are some very powerful numerical codes that have been developed which I think can make headway. But don't talk to me, I'm not an expert about numerical methods. Franco and others have done some very nice simulations where you see all these things, you see the discontinuities appear as the system evolves. But as I say, think of problems, and there are hundreds of them. And if you think you can solve it by any means, give it a whirl. Peter? You have focused on the, um, the braided fields between fixed uh, endpoints or fixed footprints. Is there a kind of a back reaction on the footprints to kind of try to untwist those fields from the, from the interactions in between? Yes. And if, and if so, what, kind of, what controls the scale, relative scale of the force? Of the uh, un in this case, it would be the granules in the photosphere of the sun, the convective cells. The stronger ones would dominate and the weaker ones would not, and I don't know how to separate it. I, it's a kinematical problem at that point. Uh, but you just say, well, I see the photosphere is moving, therefore uh, I'm cranking up uh, the, the inter interleaving of the field lines. And so does the, um, does this, the net size scale of the granules then kind of imprint on the, on the, the braiding of the... Yes, and the, the scales on the granules are typically 100 kilometers, maybe, or or more, and uh, at some point it, um, it cuts off on the small side because the, the Kolmogorov spectrum gets weak. But uh, yes, and it, if you try to think about it, you can build up an interesting problem there. Thank you. Thank you, Gene, once more. Thank you. Let's see. I'm disconnected. Yeah, okay. I'll go this way. Well, the next two talks are by our two Nobel Prize winners this year. The APS always likes to have Nobel Prize winners speak at the, either the March or April meeting, but it doesn't always work out given the fire hose of invitations that often follow the prize. But since many of us in gravitational wave physics suspected that the prize might go to LIGO this year, and since I'm program chair for the meeting, and since I was in Paris at the time, I was able to pre-prepare some invitations so that when I, as I watched the streaming of the Nobel people coming out, announcing the prize going to Ray, Kip, and Barry, I was able to press the button three times and send invitations to them to speak at this meeting so that at a moment of stunned weakness, they would accept. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> Kip was already committed, no big surprise, elsewhere this weekend, so he had, had to decline. Uh, but Ray and Barry have agreed to speak, and uh, I think they're even melding some of Kip's talk into theirs, so it's, a, it's going to be a, a three, two, three and two presentation. So I'm very happy to invite the first speaker, Ray Weiss. He got his PhD in 1962 at MIT, and has been at MIT since 1964. 
He's a pioneer of two iconic experiments in uh, physics and astronomy, cosmic background radiation and COBE, and also LIGO. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has received numerous awards and prizes, the most important of which, of course, is the 2007 Einstein Prize of the APS. <laughs> so I'm happy to invite Ray to come and speak on the very exciting title, LIGO and Gravitational Waves 1. <laughs> oh my, thank you. <laughs> wow. All right. I hope I can get all this stuff to work here. Uh, look, thank you for having me. I mean, irrespective of the Nobel Prize, and I want to say something beforehand of the talk. And, the, and we did the same, by the way, at the Nobel ceremony. Thing is that we decided, this is Barry, Kip, and I, that we were going to divide the field up into th three pieces. And what I am going to talk about is a uh, little bit of the history, a little bit of the ideas that make the detection possible. And then Barry is going to talk about what we actually have discovered and how it was organized. And Kip was going to talk, if he was here, uh, about the future in a way. Now, Barry, I have to give Barry enough time to talk because he has to do two talks, you see. So I'm going to try to be on time. The first thing that both of us, all of us, have said when we started this in Stockholm was that we were representatives of a very large number of people who all were extremely creative and very important. About 1,000 people were involved in this Nobel Prize. And we can't claim it for ourselves. It really belongs to all of them. And that's important. And it belongs to much more than LIGO. It belongs to Virgo, which is an Italian project. It belongs to GEO as well. So, it's hard to accept the thing, unless, for me at least, unless I see it in the context of being a representative rather than for myself. The other thing which, before I start, I'd like to make sure you understand is that, and you, I'll tell you a little more about it in the talk, is that the NSF was an absolute hero in this. And uh, the fact is that they supported this thing, this whole idea of gravitational wave research, is their baby, it doesn't belong to any other agency in the government, it may ultimately go to NASA now because of Lisa, but they did it for about 45, 50 years. They supported this thing. And they supported it at a most risky time when it wasn't really completely formed. The ideas were beginning, the technology wasn't quite ready, but they supported it anyway. And then in our own ineptitude, we screwed up in, in administering the thing. Between Drever and Kip and myself, we didn't know how to manage it. So we screwed up and we went through bad times. They saw us through that, too. And then they, thank God, Barry came in and organized the thing right. And so he saved the NSF and all of us, okay? But nevertheless, through all those vicissitudes, they saw us through this thing. And ultimately, they, they won very big. I think the investment they made in something very risky has paid off. It's really quite amazing. So... Let me start by saying, uh, I, now let me see if I can make this thing work here, this. Yeah, good. Uh, this talk, by the way, has elements that, of the talk on Saturday. That's unavoidable because that's the way it was given. So remind you first of uh, a little bit of where Einstein fit into this thing. Newton's theory was a very good theory to begin with. And uh, what Einstein did is for reasons that have to do both with that you had to incorporate special relativity in gravity somehow, and you had to include the idea of high velocities and communication between things. He invented a theory for many reasons, which was not a theory in which there was a gravitational force anymore. It was a theory much like what's in this picture. And let me see if any of this stuff works. How do you make the, well, I guess, okay, I see. Uh -huh. you, had, you had to do something over there. Well, all right, this, this oh, there's a, I don't know how to make the uh, cursor work. Okay. Anyway, what you see in that picture, which is up behind me, is a, a, effectively a, a three-dimensional network which has been cut with a cut, two-dimensional cut. Like, think of a jungle, jungle gym, if you like. And what you see in that is that near you, where all the, flats are, the flat parts are, is uh, there is no distortion of space. And the theory, in fact, does this. It relates the distortion, uh, the matter distribution to the distortion in space and time. That's the, the new way of thinking about gravity. And the distortion doesn't exist far away from the thing that is the big yellow thing, which is the sun. Can, I, can't, I can't make this work. Uh, 
Could you do it? What's, why is the reason that that doesn't work? It, it'd be quite useful to get it to work. Huh? You see how you're pointing it? Yeah. Does that work for you? Should I do it with my finger? No, you do it with, see the mouse move? Yeah, and no, of course I see that, but uh, does anybody see this themselves? You can, okay, thank you. I didn't realize that. Okay, so there's the sun, and out here, which I have trouble seeing, um, there is no distortion, and what the other thing that's going on in this picture is that you put clocks everywhere. That, of course, that's not drawn in the picture, but the clocks out here at every intersection point are all going at the same rate, and they're going at the rate they would have if there had been no sun there. And then you see a little dimple in the, in the geometry of space and time where the Earth is. And now the idea is what happens is that, in fact, the clocks in here run a little more slowly where the gravitational field is, is large or you're close to the mass. And far away, as, as I say, the clocks run at the rate that it would have in the laboratory, in our laboratory far away from the sun. And the idea here then is, and this is as far as I'm going to say with this, is that the distortions in space now give certain paths, which are preferred paths, which are the shortest paths in four dimensions, which then is the way the things move in the gravitational field. It's a completely different way of doing gravity. And in fact, it has in it the idea of information traveling at the finite speed. And that's the next thing I want to talk about. And that is the gravitational waves. So what are they? The gravitational waves are distortions in this space. And they, are, they arise from. Uh, the same thing as an E&M, namely the accelerator, acceleration of mass, but it's not a, every, ski, every possible scheme of motion does it. It has to be non-spherical motion. And that's, uh, that's otherwise you get no gravitational radiation at all. And we'll get to that in a minute because Einstein didn't have that quite right when he first formulated this in 1916. The waves travel at the velocity of light and uh, they are transverse waves, just like e &M waves. And here what you see is a picture. I'll try to show you what, how the waves operate. These are dots which represent points in space. The gravitational wave is either coming out at you or going into the picture. And let me see if I can make this run. Uh, yeah, OK. And those dots, you'll see this pattern. This pattern is a pattern in which space gets expanded in one dimension that's transverse to the wave while in the other dimension, 90 degrees to it, it gets compressed. And that inverts because of a sinusoidal nature of the gravitational wave. That represents that thing. The other aspect of this picture that's important is that the, uh, the picture has what's at any one instant and along any one dimension, the strain in the picture. That's the change in position of two spots, like that one and that one over there. Those, are, those two, you look at those, they separate, they're moving by a lot. Where near you, they're not moving by much. Those are then characteristic things where the change in position divided by their separation is the same over the whole length. It's like stretching a rubber band. And that, the reason why I make a fuss about this is because you'll understand better how one detects the waves if once you have that picture in your mind. And so uh, that's gravitational waves. Um, OK, and now I want to say something a little bit about the 1916 paper because it's a, an interesting thing. Uh, this is a thing that's hard to read. I'm not asking you to, but at, in, the, in it, there is this remarkable, this is the 1916 paper at the end where he makes a mistake and does get spherical systems radiating, spherically symmetric accelerations radiating. He corrects that in 1918, and then, uh, then that's a different paper. And what I want to do is he says at the very end of the paper that uh, in any case one can think of, A, which is this quantity here, this is derivatives of the motion in the source, and that is the amount of power in the gravitational waves, symbolically, OK? That A, that quantity, is so, is, it will have a practically vanishing value. He does that way at the end of the paper. And uh, it's interesting. One would love to know the back of the envelope calculations that he did to do that. And I took, um, I took the sort of privilege of doing this for him. I, they haven't been found in the Einstein papers. So here is H. That's delta L over L. And here is a nice estimating formula. If you want to do anything yourself, this is the place to begin. You say, OK, here is the thing you have to evaluate, or either, I prefer this one right here. Uh, and uh, what you do is you take, the, you take Newton's constant, that's the Cavendish constant, the mass of the system, and the distance you're away from it, where, you, where you're making the measurement, and this is the velocity of light squared. This quantity, gm over rc squared, is the, is the strength of gravity. In, in other words, here in our room, it's about 10 to the minus 10. At the, su at the surface of the sun, it's about 10 to the minus 6. And at the edge, at, uh, near the event horizon of a black hole, it's about 1. So it says a lot of things. We live in a very, very weak gravitational field. And many of the effects of these curvature effects, they were talking about, you won't see them here. You have to do 
handstands to see any of this stuff. And then the, the, the drive term is the velocity squared divided by the velocity of light squared. So uh, I'll get to this formula in a second. But the thing is that uh, what you now let's take some examples. For example, what Einstein, what Einstein may have been thinking about at that time is, for example, for him, it might have been uh, two trains crashing into each other. What kind of gravitational H do you get for that? So we, I made the number for him. Uh, in 10 to the fifth kilograms for the mass, you can read it for yourself. Uh, slow train in Europe, it's much faster nowadays. In the United States, it's still about this. Uh, and uh, then you, you, you imagine the collision is about a third of a second, let's say. Uh, but you have to be in the radiation zone. You have to be far enough away, so you're at least one wavelength away to see the H. And that number is 10 to the minus 42. That's a number that's really impossible. I mean, it's very impossible. Okay, so if he did this, and I think he probably did, he might have come to that conclusion in that last sentence. He might have even known, or tried, he certainly knew, of binary stars. And in a binary star, there, could you, through a telescope, for example, see the aspect of that star changing, that binary system changing, as a function of time? So you put some numbers into, the, again, this, this relation, and uh, use the masses of the sun, use a day for the period, to assume you're near the center of the galaxy, although that wasn't known to Einstein at the time. And uh, you get numbers of about 10 to the minus 23 with a period that's half the period of uh, the, uh, half a day. That turns out that's a tiny number for most people, but that's sort of a sensible number nowadays. And it turns out that if you were looking in a, a, at that system through a telescope and use this formula and ask how much radiation is how much energy is leaving that system due to gravitational waves, you wind up with a number that's 10 to the 13 years before you see sort of 1 over E of the amount of energy in that system. So again, hopeless. And so it's quite reasonable that Einstein would have said you can't see anything. And this would never play a role in science. Well, it began to play a role in science in a deep way in, uh, when Hulse and Taylor found this binary pulsar system. And the system is very, very much like what I was just describing to you. Uh, what, what was discovered was the pulsar, by the way, is a neutron star. And it, this one happens to go at 17 hertz. And they saw this thing. I, Hulse actually saw it at Arecibo. And what happened is he saw this thing changing rate a little bit. And what was finally interpreted as to, to go, it was going, this one, the pulsar, was going around another. And they were going orbiting. And as if the Earth is over here someplace, the um, uh, the thing is a little faster, the rate, because of the Doppler shift when it's coming toward you and slower when it's going away. And that had a period of about eight hours. And th that system became a test bed for testing general relativity. It was one of the most magnificent systems in the first. And one of the more significant results that came out of that is that as time wore on in the observation, and this is what's shown in this picture, namely this is EPIC, starting about 1973, going to this, it's still going, going, but this, this picture ends at about 2000. And this is the change in the period, the orbital period of it. It's getting shorter and shorter. And those dots are the data. And the curve that goes through it is pretty much the Einstein field equation solutions for that body, problem once you know the masses. And so it was the very first evidence of gravitational waves. And that is, in fact, and, and the inference made by that, I consider the discovery of gravitational waves. OK. So the first person really to try to do this on the ground, and that came out of the, uh, the Chapel Hill Conference in 1957, was Joe Weber, who was in Maryland. And he and John Wheeler got together, and they began, because that was a big discussion at that meeting, what are the real things that might come from gravitational waves. Uh, he, they decided, uh, this is actually Weber's idea, but it was co-joined by, by John Wheeler. And they, he started looking for gravitational waves, exciting a big aluminum bar like that thing. You see where I, if you can see that pointer, that's what I'm pointing to. And here you can see Joe putting strain gauges on, the ga on that to, to look at the stretching of that bar but due to the stretching of the, uh, due to gravitational waves. Behind him is the vacuum system in which you put this. Now, what Weber did this experiment in 1969, he published the, a thing called evidence for the discovery of gravitational waves when he had three of these, one in Chicago and two in Maryland running, and he saw sort of two or three pulses a day. That was very controversial. It was not established by others. And what happened is that uh, now we know, knowing how the bars work, that he was probably, by a factor of a million, too insensitive to actually see gravitational waves of the kind, and we'll get to that in a minute. His sensitivity in H was about 10 to the minus 15 at about a kilohertz. 
So what was then invented is, uh, and was known, by the way, this invention isn't mine. It's a lot of people were involved in this. The Russians, Gerstenstein, back in 1962 had this idea, and then even Weber had it, and then uh, Bob Forward worked on it. Uh, but, but the thing is that this, this idea was to use a different technique. And that is, uh, this technique, well, here's a laser, this is an interferometer, there's a beam spitter, and if you want to refer this picture to the dots that I showed you with the red spot, that's about where the middle was of that picture, that red square. And these are the most distant masses. And now we set up, you launch a light beam. Oh dear, oh yeah, okay, good. And uh, that beam is, that's the field, the, the, the wiggly thing is the field, but the red is the power. That's where there is light to be seen. And uh, what you notice is you make the two arms the same on the, in the, on the two interferometers, you will get no light to the photodetector. And that's the basis of setting the trap for detecting the gravitational wave, which now comes in from above or below, and it'll start moving those mirrors. And you'll notice as it disturbs that balance, you begin to get light at the photodetector. That's the basic idea. It's no more than that, and that is, it just it gets, has to get tricked up to be sensitive enough. So let me, and the people who actually, the first person who really came up with a number, not the first, but the most influential person who did a really good job of doing calculations on this was, was actually a, a Kip, but also Peter Salson. He, when we did something, you'll see where that is a little bit later. And the thing is, what came of it is that if you want to get in the business to do any of this, you had to get to a strain of 10 to minus 21. 10 to minus 15 wasn't good enough. And that, for example, if in a LIGO, which I'm, as I'm going to go forward a little bit, which is four kilometers long, you're winding up with measuring positions of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. So you're measuring about 1,000th of the size of a, of a proton to be able to measure this. And that gave a challenge to the field of in two places. One place was to be able to break a fringe up so you could break the whole thing up to parts in 10 to the 12. That was for the light, so you could get the position. And the other thing is you had to get isolation from ground motion, such that if you're living in a place where you have about a couple of microns, which is about the wavelength of light that we're using, of motion in this room, just because the Earth, you're sitting on a noisy Earth. So you had two big factors to, to solve. And this was solved by a whole bunch of people. In, and these are, this is, for example, the people who are in this business in 1972, in the 70s. Here, here's F.A.P. Pirani, who was actually the guy who let us consider that a free mass could, you could, in, in an invariant way, measure the position of a free, pair of free masses and see a gravitational wave. It was always a complicated thing with coordinates. The coordinates where you, do, you had to do more than just say that you saw a coordinate variation. You had to show that you saw a real variation in proper time when light beams went between things, and that was important. His contribution was absolutely fundamental to this. And then you had to do interferometry, and this is a, a group at uh, MIT was doing this. It had all sorts of new ingredients. You had to hang the masses. You had to use a lot of light to get the sensitivity down. You had to bounce the light back and forth many, many times. And that was started there. But then the people who really did a first-class job of it were the people in, in Munich. And this is Hans, Heinz Billings, who was a guy who is he's with his Weber bar. And these people, each one of those, made contributions which then were poured toward that part 10 to the 12. Most important were, for example, uh, power recycling, which I'll describe in a minute. That came both from, uh, from Roland Schilling, but also from Ron Drieber. They, they, they did it independently. But the idea of hanging everything, and the idea of not making the interferometer exactly symmetric came from uh, Frau Schnupp. So this was the group that actually built an interferometer that went and was very close to the theoretical limits. And they were really the first to do that. There was another group at Scotland. This is Ron Drieber's group. And uh, there, the significant thing is certainly Ron. He got the idea of using fabry perot cavities instead of delay lines. They, but the other one is Brian Mears, who had an idea, which we'll show in a minute, which lets you tune the interferometer, which now is being used. And uh, so uh, let me go on. And uh, here, for example, are the instruments that actually gave people the confidence as time went on that maybe you should scale this thing up even more. One was a 40-meter system at Caltech. Another, yeah, this is the 40-meter system at Caltech, but there's a very interesting paper written by the German group where they had a 30-meter system. They started with a 3-meter system. It, the scaling laws that had been established were good enough so you could see that the 30-meter thing was indeed a factor of 10 improvement over the 3-meter. So that was a very important step forward. And so there are those two things, the test beds, 40 meter in Caltech, 
the 30 meter in, 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 in Munich were critical. This is a group at MIT that was working on five meters. They did a lot of things that were important in the process also. And here is the basic interferometer that did the job. Now, the thing is that I'll walk you, I can't walk you exactly through it, but I'll give you a couple of salient points about it. There, to relate to that picture, which was the animation, uh, here's the laser. There is the beam splitter, and here is that far mirror, and there is that other far mirror. And so that's the thing that the original, that was the original conception. But that's nowhere near sensitive enough. So one of the things that you see some extra mirrors here, that one, which is between the beam splitter and the far mirror, and also on this side. And what that, that's the mirror which is partially transmitting. So what it does is it lets the beam bounce back and forth, crudely something like 300 times. So you effectively have increase the sensitivity of the system by a factor of 300, two gravitational waves by doing that. And you do that the same on both sides, so that, again, the same conditions apply that you saw in the animation. No light goes to the photodetector, because you make the time on both arms the same. And then, uh, so if you do that, here's a, this is the idea of power recycling, which was had by both the German group and, and Ron. And what the idea here is, since no light is going to the photodetector, all the light that's being injected by the laser has to be coming back to the laser. This whole system looks like a giant mirror. And so what happens is that you now look a little more carefully at what goes on right here. You put another mirror that is partially transmitting. And you make that so that if you take the light out of the laser, which would reflect it, it goes to the, goes to the, the mirror and is reflected, and you take and add that interferometrically to the light that's coming back out of the interferometer, you make an interferometer that cancels the, the beam that's coming out of the interferometer at that symmetric port. And that then makes it so that all the light from the laser is going into the system, and none is going back to the laser, which is very important. That allows you, for example, to have 10 watts of laser power here, and maybe uh, 500 or maybe several hundred watts here, and hundreds of kilowatts in here. And that's sort of the, that's the, that process, that whole process is the way you get that factor of 10 to the 12. And there is another mirror, this is Brian Neer's mirror, which I won't describe what it does. Uh, and that is what it does is it takes the signal that's coming out. Those of you who are experts, it takes those gravitational wave induced sidebands, sends them back into the interferometer for another go at being modulated by the gravitational wave. And they, that way you can tune the spectral response of the interferometer. It's a very clever idea. So that's the interferometer that made the detection. Now, meet right after this, the, the idea, all those ideas existed when this was done, which I'm about to talk about, but the instrument hadn't yet been built. This is now in 83, and since we're giving a little history, this is a study that was done by Peter, Peter Salson and, and the people at MIT, and by uh, Stan Whitcomb, who was at Caltech, for doing the following. It was by 83 quite clear to us that you could now, with all the advances that had been made in the labs, you could say, look, we could probably calculate how well a, a system that actually wants to detect gravitational waves would work. In other words, what do you need to really do a gravitational wave search if you were aiming for 10 to the minus 21? And that's what this study did with industry. It looked at the vacuum systems. It looked at the lasers that are available, looked at mirrors that are available, looked at, tried to get a first cost estimate. And it was a thing that actually was used later on by the NSF as a way of promoting this field. And it was a thing that set up a collaboration between Caltech and MIT. The next step in this thing was trying to actually get the money to do it. And this is a little later. This is now 1980. This was, that thing was in 83. This is about 1989. And this is a proposal with all these people. I'll, I won't give you all of them, but here's Ron again. Here's the person who would become the director of the LIGO project because Ron, Kip, and I couldn't run it. And uh, he pulled the whole thing together and then got himself into trouble also. But that was later. And uh, here is an engineer, and here's Kip. And the interesting thing that, that Robbie Boat did is he made a coupling, because he saw how difficult this was going to be. Uh, and he was an experimenter himself. So what he did is he coupled the scientists with an engineer. That coupling was done so that nobody could make decisions that on infrastructure or even on uh, uh, almost everything that you in the build, the size of the buildings, how the buildings looked, how the power stations had to be built, all those things that are very rudimentary so that they would not screw up the experiment. That was a very useful thing to do, to couple the scientists and the engineers. And uh, so that proposal was really the beginning, and it was the attempt to be get, to get the money. And, that, uh, and so I think, I've, since I'm going to forego this because I'm running out of time, 
But this is a picture, I'll just say what it is, and it, you can find it in other talks. Uh, it's a picture of what are the different elements inside the interferometer that make the noise. And I'd rather not stick with it, because I, I want to make sure Barry gets his turn, because he has the important information for you. Okay? So let me go on. The next step here was to improve, and this is after initial LIGO was done, was to improve even more. And the important thing was to improve at the performance of that system at low frequencies. And what the problem at low frequencies was, was ground noise and thermal noise. And here are the contributions that were made that were critical to the detection that, uh, that Barry will talk about. Namely, one of them is to, first of all, make the, uh, both the isolation better from the ground noise and acoustic noise, and reduce the thermal noise, which was all brought in by the suspensions. And uh, in these, most of it's brought in by the suspensions. And so here is a spring that's attached to the ground in some way, or attached to a, a place that's vi vibrating more. And then each one of these is just pendula. That's one pendulum. That's supported by another. And that supports another. And finally, here's that very precious mirror, which is the thing that now does the re response to the gravitational wave. And this thing, this, this, this four-element suspension was built by the people in Glasgow as part of the con their contribution to LIGO. And it's mounted on a system which I'm only going to describe to you. It's sitting here. There it is. And it's sitting on an object that is an active vibration system. This is something actually you could use in your laboratories if you're really worried about making very, very low vibration noise, something we can contribute to you. It's a little expensive, but maybe it could be made cheaper. What it is is it uses seismometers and measures the vibration on a platform measures the amount of ground noise that is, or a ground noise, period, noise, that's still vibrating the platform. But then there are pushers on the platform, and you use those pushers in a feedback system to null the seismometer. And it's done twice. And that's, an, that's a system that really works for the low frequency part of the gravitational, of the, of the noise spectrum. And uh, I think I just want to, that, since I didn't go to the noise spectrum here, I'm not going to do it here either. So. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the, some human things, which are actually important, and then I'm almost done. I want to point out to you how it was that the NSF came into this thing with the strength it did and why they took the gamble. And the, I contend much of that was all due to Richard Isaacson, who is a picture right here. That's him. He was a student of Charlie Misner's. He wrote a very important paper in this business, which at the time, back in the late 60s, even after the Chapel Hill conference, was to show that if you actually set up a, the calculation properly, you could show analytically that a system lost energy to gravitational waves. This was still a heavily contested thing, even by, even by the Chapel Hill Conference. It was less contested after that, but it was still a big issue. And if you look at the history of this field, you'll find out that Eddington, for example, who wrote his own book on relativity, just said that this, has a, he had a word for it, gravitational waves move at the speed of thought. Okay? He, he just didn't believe in them. And he got, because he got into trouble in the calculations of a binary system. The person that Rich Isaacson then convinced was his boss. Uh, his boss was Marcel Barden, a high energy, or a middle energy physicist, nuclear energy, came out of Columbia. And he convinced that what, what Rich did is he convinced that Barden, who was head of physics at the time, that this was an interesting field to go into. Yes, it was risky, but it had an enormous payoff. And it was just the right kind of thing for the NSF to do, which was still a pretty fledgling organization at that time. In other words, the big money in science had always come from the military. And they were really making changes in the society from the many they were putting into science. And he thought that maybe the technology that would be developed to do this incredible sensitive experiment would also be something that would bring the NSF into something which was important for not just scientists, but for the science and technology in the whole society. By the way, and he succeeded in convincing his boss, and his boss then convinced others, which we'll get to that in a minute. Just a thing about him, he, he is now retired, and he, while he was still at the NSF, he became an expert on, he worked with a textile museum in, in Washington, and he became an expert on textiles that were in in, in, southern, in southern Asia, it's mostly in Kazakhstan and play, Uzbekistan and places like that. And he had a lovely exhibit of tent bands. These are bands around the yurts. Anyway, he's a wonderful man, has singly responsible, really, I think, for keeping this thing going. And then there were people at the NSF who were crucial at the very top. And the three are, these were heads of the NSF. Felix Bloch was an engineer, and he was the first who actually tried to get money into this thing. And they had made the decision by that time. That's sort of in the um, yeah, middle 80s. 
And uh, he, was, he tried, in fact, to see if he could put it into the, NR, uh, into the uh, radio observatory in West Virginia as a place to put it. Well, it turned out not to be practical, but the idea was now planted in the NSF. Then, when the astronomers got very worried about that all the money in astronomy would go into LIGO because of the O, which is the observatory, they were very upset by that. Uh, Walter Massey, who was then head of the NSF, effectively, when the astronomers came to him, he said, look, we're doing this because it's interesting for everybody. And he, he held the case. And then, Neil Lane actually was implemented the ability to do something which all of us have benefited from since, and LIGO was one of the first to benefit from it, was to let the NSF do a large project. In other words, something, it's the MREFC line item in the, in the budget of the NSF, in the congressional budget. That's major research equipment facilities construction. And it got, gets a shot of about 100 million a year, I think. That's, I don't know the number anymore, but it was that for a while. And LIGO was one of the, but was not the only beneficiary of that. Telescopes were, uh, the, the ALMA project. I mean, there's a whole list of other projects that now allows the NSF to do large projects. And I feel that, I, I, I feel rather proud that we were ones to help push that through. And lastly is now, and that's gonna be our next speaker here is Barry. Uh, the, Li the LIGO project itself became really organized and was no longer just a run as a skunk works, which is the way it was run during the di time of, of Robbie Vogt. Nothing wrong with skunk works, but it was the wrong time to make a skunk works. He needed more people. And that's what Barry saw that right away when he was asked to take it over. And he brought in uh, a deputy director for LIGO. This is Al Azzarini and an engineer, the, system, the, the project engineer, and, and a project manager. And then and, and Stan became part of the, of the management. Of the, he became the project scientist. So thank you very much. some questions. Thank you for mentioning Rich Isaacson and Marcel Bardon. I was a rotator in the NSF physics division at the time this was going on. Uh -huh. And the, it was clearly the most bold, imaginative idea in the office. And the progress was so strongly positive that even a one-time, one-year rotator became enthusiastic, hey, huh. maybe, just maybe, this is going to work. <laughs> so thank you for mentioning. So you got fooled as well, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to mention on your, when you talk about the uh, first discovery, the indirect discovery of gravitational waves and show the picture, uh, the careful work, the careful measurement was Taylor and Weisberg and Joel Weisberg because he didn't, was not part of the Nobel Prize. I'm sorry. Elected, so I really wanted to. Yeah. Look, a, a lot of people have said that. It's, it's a Halston Taylor won the Nobel, Nobel Prize. I, the paper by Weisberg and, and Taylor is the classic paper. Hulse was the graduate student who happened to see the, the pulsar. Uh, he found it in Arecibo. And you're absolutely right, Weisberg, and, and, and that's actually one of those lovely papers I know, and if I would beseech you to look at it for a very interesting reason. Go and look how the data analysis was done on that, and you'll see how they, if they leave out any one of probably four or five residues of, 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 uh, of the relativistic effects, like the, the perihelion advance, or the aphelion advance, or the, even the, bend, the bending of light across the thing, uh, you'll find out that the residuals get to be big, very, very big. And if they leave out the gravitational waves, the residuals get big also. So it was an absolutely wonderful way to demonstrate that, uh, that all the different terms and the relativistic, correct, relativistic solutions were necessary. Now, thank you for mentioning that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As a person who did my PhD for the, yeah. Oh, you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. PhD for gravitational wave detection. In the early days, in, in the 1968, I started. So when this discovery of um, gravitational wave uh, 150914 was announced, I, of course, saw the, the press release. I was uh, deeply awed by two things. The 
the pure thought process based on principles that he believed, Einstein derived this very strange theory which predicts space-time is curved uh, by mass and you have a black holes eventually. Those are very strange things and then that has been proved to be right. Another thing is this technology. Einstein thought, Einstein could never imagine the technological revolution uh, in the past 100 years. And in many, so LIGO took advantage of this uh, supercomputers and all these numerical abilities and so on, and mirrors and, and vibration isolation, all this. You have to have hundred, hundreds of technologies work together. And all this work together yeah. to detect the gravity waves. So I was a really... You're, you're stealing oh. Barry's talk. That's what you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm still awed. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying. All right. He was in this business for years and still is in the business of bar detectors. Yeah. Well, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So our next speaker is Barry Barish. He he received his PhD from Berkeley in 1962 and uh, moved to Caltech and has been there ever since. Rather strange, all our three big winners went to an institution and stayed there the whole time. Maybe the lesson is don't move around. I don't know. Um, after his distinguished career in experimental particle physics, he became director of LIGO in 1997. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and also served as APS president in 2011. So he's going to talk about LIGO and gravitational waves, too. Well, I'm going to pick up this long story uh, where essentially where Ray left off. And there's another 20 some years to go. So uh, I'm. Uh, going to also pick up part of what Kip would have done if he was here, but mostly on the experimental end. I mean, he can do the speculations about the science. What I want to do is give you some sense of what's possible in the future experimentally to open up this field uh, even more. So that's uh, what I want to add. That's basically shown in this picture here to show you that we're moving already. You'll notice in this picture what it is is a picture of how well we can point to where the source of gravitational waves when we detect them come from. And you see these long banana-like forms. That's where we were when we made the detection. That's where we were until last August. And you'll notice two uh, places where the spots are much smaller. And that's just one indication of how, as we move forward, our ability has opened up new and will open up new possibilities. In this case, it's the adding of the Virgo detector to us, which gives us three detectors, enabling us to point much better. And we've had uh, pretty spectacular results since then, which I'll point out, uh, and since actually the Nobel Prize work was done. So uh, how do I go forward? I'm uh, also going to show people, uh, as Ray pointed out, we, this is not done by just the three of us or even a handful of people. Uh, he was able to point out many of the main people in the early days. Now it's grown to a thousand. So I'm not able to actually pick out and point out many of the important people, so there's a danger of who you pick out. And I've chosen to do it in a particular way, and that is that Clearly, the amount of science that's come out has given us the opportunity to talk in many forums, and many of you have heard talks on gravitational waves. They're mostly done by the scientists who have uh, built the analysis system, analyzed the data, interpreted the data, and so forth. Since they got, have gotten that visibility, I'm going to concentrate on the, basically the heroes who have worked on building this device, putting it together, making it work, and so forth. So I'm uh, sh leaving out the people that, of course, have done most of the scientific work. So first, how we're organized. This started, as Ray said, as a merger of two R&D efforts that were being carried out toward 
using interferometers as a technique at Caltech and MIT, uh, and that was before I came on the picture, but it basically brought the two uh, groups together. Uh, by 1994, when I came in later that year, we received our major funding, and we created what we called the LIGO Laboratory. So the LIGO Laboratory is Caltech and MIT, and basically the distribution of the large funding that we get from the NSF comes to the LIGO Laboratory. The rest of the collaboration has, uses the traditional uh, peer-reviewed grants to support the science. So I'm going to focus mostly on the laboratory, which consists of about 170-some people, staff, including all types, that basically are responsible for the development, the carrying out of the uh, implementation, and the running and improvements of the detector itself. So that's the LIGO uh, laboratory. I was the first director since I created it. Uh, Jay Marks, who was a particle uh, physicist from Berkeley came and replaced me in 2005. And presently, the lab is run by Dave Reitze, and uh, the deputy director is Albert Lazzarini. Both, all of these have been with us for 15 years or so. The labs themselves are rather distant and hard to get to, and because we want very quiet places. One in Hanford, Washington, and you can see the interferometer there. It was run originally uh, for until very recently by Fred Robb, who was the site director there, and then Mike Landry, who presently, who grew up there, was hired and basically spent 10 years working at the lab and now runs the lab. So if you visit Hanford, he's the main person uh, to see. The staff at the labs is about 30 or 35 uh, that are employed and left and there, and then the number of us that just show up and work there means the average number if you walk into LIGO per day is a lot smaller than say Fermilab or something. It's about 50 or 60 on a given, a given day. The other lab is in Louisiana in the uh, commercial pine forest there. And that's uh, in a part called Livingston, Livingston, Louisiana. The, the original head of that lab was Mark Coles who's now uh, an officer at the NSF and the present uh, head is Joe Giammi. So that's who basically runs it. Uh, this is just, I can't show very many pictures technically, but I'll show a few. This is just to give you a sense of the scale. It's not the scale physically, uh, except for length, of something like the, the experiments at CERN. This is the centerpiece where the light comes together and the mirrors and lasers and so forth are. These tanks, I didn't unfortunately pick one where a person is there, but a person goes about 30 or 40 percent up these tanks. Inside those tanks is the business end of LIGO, the, the seismic isolation system that uh, Ray talked about, the mirrors, the lasers are behind here, and big gate valves that you can see in these uh, pictures that isolate the working end of LIGO from the long vacuum system that we have. Uh, in 1997, so this started in 1994, we created what I've shown you and it's continued. In 1997, we recognized that in order to optimize the chances of success, we needed to bring in more strengths, more people, more, especially more areas that we didn't really have in the LIGO and the LIGO laboratory, Caltech and MIT. So we created a more traditional collaboration, which we call the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. Uh, I asked Ray to be the first uh, spokesperson of that, and then after that it's become more democratic where we've elected the spokespersons. It is, he was followed by uh, Peter Salson, who's back here somewhere, uh, Dave Reitze, who later became the, the uh, LIGO Laboratory Director, uh, Gabriela Gonzalez, and presently David Shoemaker of MIT. It's a large and dispersed collaboration, 18 countries, more than 100 institutions, and something like 1,200 collaborators, of which 1,000 had done enough work so they were uh, able to be authors by our rules on the uh, discovery paper, but basically 1,200 people. Plus, we have a second collaboration that we work with, 
which is the Virgo collaboration, so this is very odd. And that now when we're showing data, it's from two different collaborations, and we have a collaboration of collaborations in a sense, which doesn't exist anywhere else. Each has their own independent rules, independent groups, uh, but we work together. That's been true since 1997, when we agreed on a scheme to basically format our data in the same way, so that we can analyze data from Virgo, they can analyze data from LIGO. Uh, this is the picture that I like to look at that basically shows what happened after we built LIGO. So I couldn't go through very much of the technical uh, details, but uh, this is an evolution of the uh, sensitivity where it's more sensitive as you go down. If you can read the scale, it's the scale, kind of scale that uh, uh, Ray showed. And each of the lines is subsequently about six months to a year apart between 2000 when we turned on the detector and 2005 or 2006 when we reached pretty close to design sensitivity. On the, low si on the left side, uh, I'm not much better at this than Ray was. At the left side is the uh, limitation that comes from seismic isolation, how well we do seismic isolation. On the right side, the part going up is uh, basically the shot noise or photostatistics that limit you, and in the middle, uh, thermal uh, noise. And each one, you see, becomes subsequently better. So each time we would make the detector as good as we could, pointing to get down to the little outline on the bottom, and uh, take data, look for gravitational waves, didn't see any, licked our wounds basically, made the changes we could, and uh, improved and ran again. And each time subsequently, and I think we had a total of seven runs, we called S1 through S7, uh, searching for gravitational waves, collecting about $50 million a year from the NSF, and somehow they kept funding us uh, because we didn't see anything. Maybe a little, a little better limits, but I don't know if that justified uh, that much money. So as Ray said, they were tremendous heroes in somehow keeping this alive through five different uh, directors. Eventually, we got down to very close to the design, which you can see by the dotted line on the bottom. Uh, that was about 205 or 206. And uh, we, proposed, we did the technical work to improve the detector for a second generation, which we had actually told the NSF about in the 1990s. Uh, and they incorporated in our funding not only the building of this first detector, but kept keeping us, our group, going to do the R&D and development work for an Im improvement to the detector, which we now call Advanced LIGO. Uh, we called it LIGO 2, but the NSF didn't like that because LIGO 1, 2 might infer LIGO 3, 4, and so forth. So it became Advanced LIGO. Uh, anyway, we were funded eventually by about 2009, and the goal was the following. You can see the dashed line, the dotted line along here. It was the design line. The two very last runs in sensitivity that we did on the original LIGO are shown here, somewhat of a different configuration. One was better at high frequency, one at lower frequency. But that's where we were uh, before we built advanced LIGO. We made a goal to improve the sensitivity a factor of 10 over the whole uh, frequency band. And a factor of 10, you should realize we measure an amplitude, so a factor of 10 gives us a factor of 1,000 more volume of the universe that we're looking at. So the whole scheme for us in improving is quite different than, say, the LHC, where in looking for the Higgs and establishing a signal, uh, you have to keep taking data, taking data, taking data, because you gain as the square root of the amount of data that you take. We gain as the cube if we make a sensitivity improvement. So for us, uh, time down to, and the uh, uh, incentive to improve the detector versus take long data runs is very different. Anyway, we wanted to improve a factor of 10, which I emphasize gives us a fact, if we reach it, we're not there yet, uh, will give us a factor of 1,000 more 
volume of the universe or sensitivity than we had during the initial LIGO running. I, I've outlined just in simple picture here what the main techniques are to do that. The highest frequencies, the main effect is the power of the laser, amount of light. Uh, we do something else called squeeze light. Uh, in the middle frequencies, it's basically the thermal effects, so it's the test masses and suspension systems that dominate the sensitivity in that region. And at the low end, it's better seismic isolation, which uh, uh, Ray briefly talked about. For us, then, this is the complicated picture, just listing them all. I don't have time to go uh, through them in detail. So here we've changed, we're changing almost everything by improvements that we developed early in 2000, but we were very careful to build the main expense of LIGO, which is the infrastructure, so that it could accommodate uh, the upgrade to a rather different detector that we built for advanced LIGO, where we had to do all this R&D. And that was an important point, because even though advanced LIGO was expensive, it did use the more expensive part, which is almost all of the infrastructure that we built originally in LIGO. And that was by design at the beginning that we did that. So we have uh, changed almost everything, improving the, developing more powerful lasers, improve the laser power, bigger and better mirrors, 40 kilograms instead of uh, 10, uh, a different, different optics and interferometer uh, uh, readouts, and uh, a better seismic isolation system, and much larger and more uh, better mirrors. And all these areas we're continuing to improve and will in the future, and I'll touch on that at the end. Uh, but that's how to improve the factor of 10 what I'll point out further is what mattered for the detection that we made. And that I can show here. We, we turned on after a four-year construction period of advanced LIGO, and after roughly a year, we had improved uh, at least a factor of three over most of the bandwidth. The higher curve is the initial LIGO, and the next one down is the uh, Advanced LIGO, there's two colors there. They're almost identically on top of each other, which tells you that when we do things the same, the Livingston and, and Hanford interferometers basically perform the same. And the line below is what we're approved and funded for and have built the technologies for, but aren't there yet, but what we believe we can reach in the next uh, few years. So uh, we've basically improved a factor of three, which I, I emphasize is a factor of 27 in volume of the universe that we look at. But note that at low frequencies, we actually improved a factor of 100. And that's why uh, questions asked often is, how could you run for 10 years? You turn on the new device, and after a few days, you saw gravitational waves. And that's because a factor of 100 cubed is a factor of a million, which basically meant we were able to look in that frequency band with sensitivity that was incredibly different than we had earlier. We still have a ways to go. It's hard to do that, but that's basically what we're capable of getting to and will in the next few years. Uh, this is just, I'm not gonna go through it because Ray did, a little bit anyway, but it was the adding, if you picked one in my mind, one thing to just have an elevator speech of what made the difference, it was adding active seismic isolation to our system. And the active seismic isolation improved the low frequency response such that we could make the detection where we improved by the factor of 100. The improvement of the, of the suspension system is also part of that, so it's the whole uh, suspension system. With that, we were able to turn on in September of 2015 having improved a factor of three, or uh, uh, at, at least a factor of three overall frequencies, and uh, almost immediately saw this. Uh, in Livingston and Hanford, almost identical signals. They were uh, 6.9 milliseconds apart, which told us something about the direction, poorly, like I showed in, in the beginning. 
And I emphasize this plot here, which is the picture of the time and frequency. We call it a chirp signal. It starts at low frequencies and at weaker and gets stronger and then goes to high frequencies, the so-called chirp signal. So I'm plotting frequency versus time here. The top one is the discovery event. And I note that the low frequencies, the frequencies covered by the improved seismic isolation system is what basically made this possible. So it was our ability to go to low frequencies with a factor of 100 improvement, factor of 100 cubed in rate that enabled this measurement. The second the detection, which we made in December of the same year, 2015, is on the, in the bottom, and you can see again that most of the signal is in this very, very low frequency range. So in analyzing that event, we then have the top graph, the top picture, which is almost raw data. That's basically the signals that we saw immediately, only band passed so that it uses the frequencies that we basically are studying, that is 35 to 350 hertz, and they have a time difference of 6.9 milliseconds. The second line down is the numerical relativity, and that had been developed during the period of about 2005, 2007, uh, fits to this data. We use the numerical relativity to make templates to look for the signals and then do fitting using numerical relativity to determine the parameters. The third line is important one, the residuals, which basically is a subtraction of the data from the fit to see if there's any effects that don't fit. And you can see at least qualitatively nothing but kind of the statistical errors, which means immediately just qualitatively that the fit to the data using general relativity and numerical relativity is unbelievingly good. We can carry that further and I'll show you to get the parameters in a second. So this is the picture of what we have. We start with an in spiral of two objects. They get closer together and are going faster, uh, merge, and then there's the ring down period. In the bottom is basically the size. Looking at the growing curve, the one rising and the left hand, the left hand axis, the velocity starts at about a third the velocity of light. And by the time they merge, it's about six-tenths the velocity of light. So you have to imagine these two very compact objects going around each other at highly relativistic speeds, faster and faster as they come together. The right-hand scale is in Schwarzschild radii, but in a sense it's about one unit there is about 70 kilometers. So they're only a few hundred, they start when they enter our frequency band a couple hundred kilometers apart. So we have two objects only a couple hundred kilometers apart going at about half the speed of light and then faster as they, uh, as they merge. Uh, when you see our results, we determine a lot about it. And that comes from the fact that we can write down uh, a formula, which is basically the chirp formula, which has a second order term, which I don't show here, which allows us to determine the masses of the objects, the, uh, 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 the distance away by the magnitude, the something about the spins, if we were good enough, about the precessions, which were not good enough yet, but will be when the signal to noise gets better, and so forth. So that's the kind of analysis that we do, getting the, estimating the parameters, which you see uh, in our papers, we get the sky location, the distance, and so forth. So there's a huge amount of information that comes from a single event watching it uh, uh, develop. We've used this first result and the ones after that to try to test general relativity. And that'll be a big part of the future to try to actually test general relativity as well as we can quantitatively. Uh, so far, we only can test general relativity to look for violations of our dis uh, differences between Einstein's uh, formulation and what we have, rather than look at alternate formulations and fit those because we just don't have uh, phenomenological formula to do that. Uh, so instead, we just use a formula here. We've used a, a dispersion term and asked whether you could in 
include, whether the data will allow including an extra dispersion term on top of uh, general relativity or, or not. Uh, one limit of that is the limit that is that you would have incorporated a graviton of some mass that was incorporated because that would put in a dispersion term. If I put that in, we have a limit on the graviton, which is pretty significant, of 7.7, .7, 10 to the minus 23 EV over C squared. Uh, of course, there is no graviton in Einstein's theory, but that kind of test is what we are beginning to do with general relativity and will be a big part of our future program. So where are we? The second part of the science is the astrophysics. And there, um, we've uh, a set of conclusions. First, that we basically have directly seen stellar black holes, so they exist. Uh, we know now that they form into binary pairs. We know that they merge, binary pairs of black holes merge within the lifetime of, our, of the universe. And something's new, they're larger than what was expected by uh, astrophysical observations earlier. So that's new. And to me, uh, again, a first indication that we are looking at the sky in a different way and we'll see effects that haven't been seen even in all the years with electromagnetic radiation. So uh, we already have seen heavier black holes than have been seen before, and hopefully in the future we'll see objects and phenomena that are different than can be seen in electromagnetic waves. We've now reported a series of about five or six uh, gravitational wave black hole mergers. Uh, I show them here is in a kind of schematic way. The top one is the first one. It was the heaviest that we've seen. And so it barely enters our frequency band. The lighter ones stay much longer. Uh, and the most recent one, which I'll come to in a minute, neutron star uh, mergers stay for many tens of seconds. So these are the basically what are there. We've now entered into, uh, as I said on the very first slide, a new era. And this is just one step of many, I think, where the improvements will enable us to do science that uh, will be more and richer as we go in the future. I now show three sensitivity curves instead of two. The third one is Virgo, who joined us last August for the first time. That allows us to do a triple coincidence. It enables us to do something we couldn't do before as the data gets better, and that is tell something about the fact that the gravitational waves come in two polarizations. We can, uh, uh, we can separate the two polarizations with time because of the orientation of the third detector. The two LIGO detectors are basically parallel to each other within the curvature of the Earth. The sensitivity of LIGO is still somewhat better. That's the bottom two curves. Uh, and, uh, but all three of them together enabled us to get some polarization information on a first event and to uh, point better. The leaders of the Virgo collaboration I show here, the present leader is uh, Stavros Castanovetis, who basically is the one who runs the operation at the sites, just like we have a, a group at the sites, and Jo Vandenbrand, who's the head of this, of their scientific collaboration. Uh, so altogether, this is, we made, they joined us last August, and then we made an observation of uh, the last black hole merger in all three detectors. And that enables us to get some polarization, as I said, and so forth. Only a few days later, we saw for the first time a different kind of object, and this is last uh, August, and that we immediately identified as binary neutron star mergers, uh, which is shown here. And one thing we get out of it immediately is a distance. The amplitude tells us the distance. The uncertainty in that comes from our lack of knowledge of the spins of the two objects, but this was very close. It's about 50 megaparsecs away. And what happened is that we can point pretty well in the sky, shown in the right-hand side. Uh, the, the smallest band is shown there is what we tell with LIGO and Virgo, now adding Virgo. And a gamma ray burst was detected by the Fermi satellite two seconds after this. 
that opened up what people have seen, which is the whole astronomical community in different wavelengths and ways looking at uh, signals by pointing the different type of astronomical instruments to that place in the sky. And from that, uh, much has come out. I'm not, I don't have time to talk very much about it. I'll just show one thing. But we also, in doing the neutron star system, made the very first, not good yet, because it's only one event, independent measurement of the Hubble constant, which comes out of basically the fact that we uh, can measure the distance away and the, velo the velocity in a very different way than the latter system used by uh, astronomers. The two uh, astronomical measurements which don't agree with each other and are, are, people are trying to resolve in astronomy, we don't resolve but because we're not good enough on one event. But when we get tens of events, uh, we should be able to be able to have measurements that are comparable in accuracy and uh, maybe be able to help measure this well. So that is independent from us. And then from all the astronomical observations, the, there was basically a pretty fantastic agreement with a general phenomenological theory that binary neutron stars, when they come together, follow this so-called kilonova, which I don't have time to go through, uh, 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 merger. Uh, one result that has come out of this, at least phenomenologically, at least one model, is that the origin of heavy elements, which historically people have attributed to stellar collapse, uh, but it never fit very well because the process wasn't enhanced enough, uh, that basically the heavy elements, which we've never in nature, which we've never been able to explain, may well come from uh, these neutron star mergers. And this is a phenomenological analysis, which basically the yellow parts basically are what presumably come from the neutron star mergers, so that heavy elements like gold, platinum, and so forth probably came or likely came from this phenomenon. Just to point to the future, uh, this is how well we can point to this in the sky. We were fortunate on this event that was seen by both Virgo and us that we were in a favorable position in the sky. Upper left hand is where we can do it now. As we add more detectors, one in Japan, which is independent of us, and one we're building in collaboration with India, in India, the lower right-hand curve is where we'll be in the future. So the last few graphs is just to show you where we can go as we move toward the future. Uh, we're able to go, as I showed you, we're only, uh, we're a factor of two or three away from where at advanced LIGO should be able to get when we make it work properly. We've put in basically the technology or most of it to do that. Uh, so. O2 is where we were when we just turned off from this last data run. We should get to the advanced LIGO level within two, three, four years. And then we've recently turned in a proposal to the NSF, so this is not funded yet, but it basically shows you we think we know how to do the technologies to move it down further, and that's the so-called A+, which is just uh, turned in. As I say, we realize that this is a log scale, and that you cube the improvements. The improvements improve both our data rate, our ability to see other kinds of sources, and lastly, to get very much higher signal to noise to do things like test general relativity and so forth with the data that we have. I show on the right, just as an illustration, that it can also open up, hopefully, a new phenomenon. For example, we saw the neutron star merger but at high frequencies, we're studying what happens after the merger, which is this interesting compact nuclear physics effects of two objects coming together, we're not good enough to do yet. But as we improve, the, some of the phenomenology that may or may not be the right ones might start showing up if we can improve the high frequency response. So those are the kind of objectives we have. We know, at least in concept, how to make things still better. Uh, we have a concept for how well we could do eventually at the sites uh, by doing mostly things like lowering the temperature, changing the material of the test masses, 
and uh, pushing the other, other techniques that we use, like the laser uh, power. And, and what that'll give us is the ability to do something like I just showed, post-merger studies, uh, improve the signal to noise to test general relativity better, and uh, maybe most importantly, reach out further into Z or move into the cosmological region, which we're not really in yet. I want to point out that all of that is in the present generation. We also know that it's possible to build bigger and better detectors. We haven't worked on it much in the States. Actually, the NSF wouldn't let us until we delivered. And so, but in Europe, there's been a rather well-funded study for more than five years to develop a concept for a next generation de detector. That being a factor of 10 roughly better, and so qubit better than where we are now. And the idea that they have uh, is to go underground where the seismic noise is reduced and they can work at lower frequencies, uh, make it triangular, which gives more uh, redundant information and even polarization and pointing information, and run a set of six interferometers around this in the different configurations. So uh, that's what they've looked at. We've looked at some, starting to look at an alternative of maybe cheaper to stay on the Earth's surface, but make it just bigger than what we have now, 40 kilometers maybe instead of 10 kilometers. That's a very nascent uh, idea at this point, uh, but we're uh, starting to pursue that. So uh, let me last just end by saying, so far everything you've seen is coalescent binary systems, black holes and neutron stars. W submerged, we look very hard for other sources. Uh, we look for burst signals like supernova collapse, and we do that and hope to do it in conjunction with neutrinos seeing them and with uh, uh, optical or uh, astronomical observations. We look for a, a background from the early universe, stochastic background. That's easy to do experimentally. It's hard to get the, and we can do it with our data now, but it's hard to get the sensitivity that you might need, and especially at very, very high frequencies where we are. Uh, but that's another uh, very rich and maybe the, in the long term the richest uh, possibility because you can get back to the very, very early universe. And we look for continuous sources, that is spinning neutron stars in our own galaxy uh, where this story started when Ray talked. Uh, to the extent that they have a quadrupole moment at all, we can detect those. So, so far we haven't seen any, but we're looking for all these kind of sources. Lastly, and this is my last slide, we're looking right now at phenomena and gravitational waves that are in the millisecond, basically time frame, science that's in the millisecond time frame. But just like in uh, astronomy, where the richness of astronomy has been enhanced by going out of the traditional optical astronomy into infrared, ultraviolet, and so forth, uh, the same will be true of the future of gravitational waves. We're studying, and we have a rich future in that alone, the millisecond time scale. Uh, as Ray mentioned, uh, we now have an approved experiment in Europe, and hopefully NASA will rejoin that looks at phenomena in the minutes to hours time frame. And that's, uh, so it's not doing LIGO again, it's doing a different frequency band of three satellites in space. There's presently a set of experiments that use uh, timing of known pulsars to look for effects on yet a longer time scale, and that is years to decades. And lastly, uh, we can hope to see some uh, imprint of the s gravitational waves from the early universe in the billions of year time frame, at first as an imprint in polarization in the cosmic microwave background experiments, and maybe someday directly with gravitational waves from the early universe itself, which is probably the best way to get back to very, very early times. We know that uh, any sort of astronomical devices only see signals after 300,000 years because photons are absorbed earlier than that. Neutrinos could go back earlier, but they thermalize, so the chance of measuring neutrinos from the early universe is 
essentially not possible, or we don't think so. Gravitational waves, on the other hand, go back to the earliest times of all. They're not absorbed. The, the problem, of course, is to be able to detect those, but maybe someday in the future that'll happen. So thank you. On one of your charts, you showed the Hubble constant, which had very large deviations. Does that mean there's a possibility that Hubble's law, instead of being linear, is nonlinear? Uh, I don't think it had deviations. I didn't stay on it very long, but there, there's two different measurements of the Hubble constant by astronomers, and they don't agree with each other, and that's a puzzle right now. Our measurement is not very good because it's only one device. I, I was only showing it not for any interpretation of what might be or might not be true of the Hubble constant, but that there, in, at least in, in practice now, I think we'll be able to have an independent way of measuring the, 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 uh, the Hubble constant itself or the acceleration of the universe. You talked about the lack of information on spin of the, the final state um, of the black hole in the merging and also um, the future of looking at the spin of neutron stars. And you also talked about the X and plus degrees of freedom and polarization. Um, could you tell me, elaborate on, on what's required in order to extract this information on the final yeah. spin, spate, spin state? Yeah. Um, uh, the events that we saw, the very first one in black holes had a, the way we parameterize things, a signal to noise of 25 to one. If we improve, and the, the limitation is that, how, because it's not the biggest effect when we do this parameter estimate, estimation. The, uh, in order to get the uh, spins individually and not statistically by measuring many of them on individual events, it looks like we need 10 times better, 250, 250 to one uh, signal to noise. But of course, if our sensitivity is 10 times better, we should see events like the very first one that gave 25 to one signal to noise. But right now, we're not able to do more than take the five or six events and try to put those together. The problems are that all of those are different orientations and you can't put them together in any way, one way. So the right way to do it is actually to have single events that have good enough signal and noise so that these smaller parameters uh, can be extracted. Going back to the Hubble's constant uh, determination, so what would one require to decrease the error, just larger number of events? Yeah. This, was, this, this idea was first done by Bernie Schutz many years ago, actually, in Nature. And he estimated at that time that uh, in, totally independently with gravitational waves, roughly 100 events would do the kind of accuracy we're talking about. We actually do uh, slightly differently than that. If you can identify where the gal what, what the galaxy is, rather than us determine it from our distance, which isn't as good, uh, and which was done for this single event, uh, then it's likely that you can do it with much less than that, maybe just a few tens of events. Thank you. So this is a, more a question about gravitational waves in general, and it's one that I sometimes hear read more popularly, and I'm not really sure how to answer, which is, you know, the gravitational waves we see are these incredibly tiny strains, but what would it look like or feel like if we were actually close enough that these waves and these strains started to be visible on a human scale? What would it feel like or what would it look like? Yeah. Well, you would get shorter and fatter and taller and thinner at the frequency of the gravitational wave. Maybe your, your question's more subtle than that, but basically you would change like going back and forth in a these mirrors in an amusement park at the frequency of the gravitational wave. 
I, I don't, were you asking something more physiologically? I'm not, well, I guess I'm not sure, but I think that's an answer, yeah. So you don't have to worry very much. Uh, okay, strictly a technical question. I'm wondering with the better part of a megawatt bouncing uh, between the mirrors in, in advanced LIGO, how are the mirrors kept from distorting or as far as that goes, burning up? <laughs> well, burning up isn't the problem, but we do have problems of heating. And we, we have to keep the radius of curvature the same so that it comes back. And so we have heating coils. We have to do a lot. As we increase the power of the light, we have to worry about the fact that there's scattered light off any imperfections, that the vacuum is good enough so there isn't scattering. So that's why we don't just turn up the power and why you don't see uh, us quickly go. It isn't just building a better laser. We have to stabilize it very well and we have to worry about it heating up the mirrors that it goes through to get into the, and, and the scattered light and the imperfections on the mirrors and the damage to the mirrors and so forth. So we, we're doing it in steps. Uh, so you showed a plot comparing Virgo, Hanford, and Livingston sensitivities, and on that, there was a discrepancy in the sensitivities for Hanford and Livingston at low yeah, frequencies. Yeah. What is the reason for that? Uh, the, uh, We've been careful for a decade or more to make sure that when we do something in one site, we do the same thing in the other site, and we keep them the same. I showed an earlier plot where they were absolutely on, on top of each other. So the fact that one's in a swampy pine forest and the other in this high desert makes no difference. We can keep them the same. We had some technical problems, which we didn't, in Hanford, which we didn't uh, solve before we started running. And so it was just some internal technical problems. And right now, uh, we're struggling with trying to keep the two of them the same as we make uh, improvements to the, to the device. So it's just an internal technical problem. It's nothing fundamental. Yeah, just a very short question. Um, you mentioned the 40 kilometer, yeah. or at least thinking about the 40 kilometer. Yeah. Where do you imagine yeah. putting that device? I, I, I expected that. <laughs> the problem is that the Earth curves quite a bit in 40 kilometers, so that uh, the Europeans are looking at going underground. A big expensive part of that is, of course, all the ground, underground tunneling. It turns out, because I've worked on particle accelerators, that when we looked at the linear collider, uh, a uh, trenching is no cheaper than going underground, because tunnel, tunneling machines work well. So we have to avoid or not think we're staying on the Earth's surface to save money if we don't save money. And so what we're looking at is some way to find a site, like in the Southwest maybe, where there's enough of a bowl shape just by history so that it's basically canceled by the curvature of the Earth. And at least using, you know, we, we haven't found a site, but some potential areas where at least the amount of uh, cut and fill, which is what you have to do, is minimized in trying to it. So the biggest, so that's the first problem. The second is we have to make a affordable vacuum system that's that long and so forth. Otherwise, um, and we need the money, of course. So uh, this is, as I mentioned, we basically, l let me say the problem, we basically haven't done the kind of homework that's done in Europe, but it, in the future we have to make some choices. So is the choice to have many devices around the world so we can point very well and do multi-messenger astronomy, or is the choice to be, make the most sensitive possible detector, single detector, like the one that's being looked at in Europe, 
where we can press to the lowest frequencies and get the highest signal and noise and so forth. That's obviously more expensive. So we're just in the beginning stages now of trying to understand how to approach a next generation experiment and you're seeing our thought process.